But I, I'm going to run briefly through things we have to celebrate, challenges ahead of us, do some school updates. Uh, we'll talk about our research, discussions about leadership transitions at the school and at the university, and uh, a few key uh, initiatives, both at the school level and at the university initiative, and where we fit into that. I do want to uh, begin by acknowledging uh, that we are on the lands of the Coast Salish people, which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Uh, I want to uh, uh, welcome everybody here. Uh, and we do have uh, many things to be proud as a school. Uh, as uh, some of you saw, in which we've been trumpeting heavily, uh, we are uh, in the global ranking of academic subjects, which is a sort of an impact-based ranking of uh, schools. We ranked as the number three ranked school uh, in the world, and actually the number one public uh, school of public health in the world. And there's a lot to be proud of, and it really does give a tribute to our heavy impact that we make on the world, and uh, the success that we continue to have, even in an uncertain state and federal environment. The last time we gathered for one of these meetings, it was uh, literally just days after the presidential election in November 2016. Uh, the mood was heavy. Uh, since then, we've seen uh, some of our, some of the elements that we are the um, uh, most feared actually uh, begin to uh, move in a way into uh, the potential for action at the federal government. And it's meant uh, a kind of uh, 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 our willingness to have to sort of step up and protect the threats to public health and the threats to uh, um, many of the public health protections and uh, the safety net that our nation gives to those who are uh, um, most vulnerable. This is an example at the uh, uh, March uh, for Science last spring of both some uh, members of our school community uh, with their signs, as well as our Student Public Health Association banner that marched uh, through the, uh, for the entire um, uh, march. Um, we have responded. We have spoken out. We have tried to inform policymakers and the, uh, and the public of the vital work we do in improving the health of communities. And thank you all for the work you do to help tell our story. Um, our students are, of course, the uh, primary reason that we, uh, we come to work. And uh, are, uh, the, they continue to inspire us. They continue, we continue to attract some of the best and brightest students from the region and beyond who go on to do great things and accomplish a lot while they're here as well. This last year, our enrollment reached an all-time high this academic year. And uh, as those of you who, like me, have been reviewing admissions applications lately know that admissions all across the board are up at the, at the, in our school as well, meaning we continue to be able to uh, select a high, both a highly uh, uh, outstanding and talented group of students, but allows us to work to have as diverse a student body as possible as well. Uh, a few. Um, Items at a at a glance. In 2017, uh, we uh, matriculated. Uh, we have 1,514 students matriculated, uh, 567 undergraduates, 947 graduate students, uh, mostly women. Um, a small but growing proportion of underrepresented minorities. A large proportion of uh, in our undergraduate ranks uh, of first generation college students as well. Six, most of our students continue to be Washington State residents, and we have a growing element of, of international students as well. In addition, I want to highlight our uh, uh, graduation ceremony, uh, which has continued to grow in popularity with last year more than 3,000 people attending our graduation uh, ceremony at Alaska Airlines Arena. And we're going to be having another amazing event this year on June 10th, where we'll be featuring uh, our commencement speaker, Ben Danielson, from the Odessa Brown Children's Clinic is our commencement speaker. And if any of you haven't had the opportunity to hear him, he's a very inspiring and dynamic speaker. And I think it's going to be a, another great ceremony. Um, you can see that our degrees are, are, are uh, you know, balanced in terms of bachelor's degrees per year. 
uh, masters and PhDs uh, across the school. Uh, there's lots of things going on, new initiatives, curriculum on the move. I uh, want to highlight for the nutritional sciences program, uh, planning for a new undergraduate major is well underway in food systems, nutrition, and health. Uh, we're also looking at uh, a substantial uh, broadening of the uh, scope of the public health major to feature a new uh, major focus opportunity in global health and an incorporation of global health content throughout the major, uh, as well as uh, uh, specific undergraduate focus areas in nutrition and public health education. Uh, in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences, there's a new MPH track in One Health focused on uh, health concerns at the human-animal interface. Uh, but on the front burner for us is really you know, what I consider to be one of the flagship degrees of the school, the MPH degree, our in-residence MPH degree, which on our strategic plan for the last several years, we made a point that we were going to revitalize this degree. And we have, uh, I think, are rebooting the process right now to try to uh, give this degree a, uh, uh, a refresh and make it a degree that we're really proud of uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as something that we can that our students come away with, with an outstanding education, and we really feel like it's the best degree we, it can be. Uh, I asked uh, our interdisciplinary programs for updates. I want to give a few shout outs here today uh, um, and indicate that the MHA program is celebrating its 45th anniversary as a, as, a, as a program this year. And this year, administratively moved formally from being an interdisciplinary program in the graduate school to being a program within the School of Public Health. Uh, faculty in the uh, MHA program are active in work such as supporting UW Medicine's triple aim, the goals for healthcare reform, which include improving patient, patient experience, achieving better health outcomes, and controlling costs to deliver high value care. Uh, faculty are also working with uh, lots of other organizations across the region, including Neighbor Care and uh, King County Public Health. Uh, pathobiology, also uh, previously a interdisciplinary program, well actually previously, previously a department of the School of Public Health, more recently an interdisciplinary program in the uh, graduate program has now uh, officially moved as a uh, unit within the Department of Global Health, um, so that's a, that's a change. Um, in addition, just... Uh, Um, it has faculty base not only at Harborview in the NJB building, but also at the Center for Infectious Disease Research, the Hutch Children's Research Institute, and others. And there's been a lot of success uh, and achievements in that group over the last year. The Institute for Public Health Genetics, the Public Health Genetics Program, continues as a, as a program uh, based in the, uh, at the school and is in the midst of launching or, or going through the efforts to launch a program with a new master's degree in genetic counseling, which is uh, an exciting addition to the educational uh, um, group. The Center of Excellence in Maternal and Child Health continues to be a uh, uh, very successful program. Under the last year, leadership transferred to Daniel Inquivare, uh, who won a National Academic Leadership Award from the Association of Teachers of Maternal and Child Health and uh, uh, nutritional sciences, as I, as I mentioned, um, is not only now on the uh, brink of it launching an undergraduate major program as well as a track within our existing public health major, uh, but is also has lots of exciting things going on. And I'm going to, for lack of time, going to skip over them and try to move on to our upcoming slides. Need to highlight our faculty at the school level, um, new faculty. Uh, include um, Pamela Collins, uh, the new head in global health and psychiatry of a, of a new focus on global mental health, which will be an important new initiative for the, the school. Also want to highlight other new faculty, Allison Foner, who's a strategic hire in public health genetics, joined this year as an affiliate faculty member or an acting faculty member who will be joining us full time this upcoming academic year. Uh, in the Department of Epidemiology, Amy Willis, a new assistant professor in biostatistics, Carolyn Spice, a senior lecturer in health services. Um, 
uh, Christine McGrath, Mauricio Sadinle in uh, biostatistics, uh, Christine McGrath in global health, Ariana Rubin Means in uh, global health, and uh, her, uh, will, her work got a real shout out this year through the uh, interactive uh, immersive story that uh, UW put together. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Jennifer Balkus, a new assistant professor in epidemiology. And uh, our last screen of these, James Cowan. Or anybody here, any of these folks here today? Any new faculty in the room today? Um, Jim Cowan in global health, Nelly Mugo in, uh, uh, in, in global health as well, um, Marissa Baker in DEOHS and Carrie Cordero in, in uh, DEOHS as well. Lots of new faculty to welcome. Anybody here, a new staff member to the school this year? You want to highlight your uh, stand up? Stand up. Let's see a, see a new staff member here. Hi. Sistine from uh, epidemiology and introduce yourself there. Sorry? Gigi Perez from uh, the Latino Center for Health. Excellent, outstanding. Okay, um, I'll do that shout out now while we're saying the Latino Center for Health, which is I think it's on a slide later anyway. But the Latino Center for Health, which has been a sort of uh, independent uh, unit on campus this last year, as a special highlight, has now moved formally to the School of Public Health to the Department of Health Services, and we're really excited to have this opportunity to highlight the work of the Latino Center as well. And we're looking forward to this being a really rich collaborative place for you guys to be over the next several years. So welcome. Um, and that was my welcome to new staff. I guess I did that already. I got ahead of myself. So welcome. Um, so we talked about new staff. Uh, we wanted to celebrate uh, uh, a staff, uh, faculty member. I don't think I saw King come in today. But uh, maybe he's back there somewhere. But, uh, 50 years is a nice round number to accomplish at the University of Washington, and uh, King has certainly played a major role uh, in his career, primarily in the School of Medicine in his early career, focused on infectious diseases, STDs, then HIV, and then global health, and as the founding chair of the Department of Global Health here, built the uh, department that we're so proud of now, and uh, you know, take a minute to remember. Um, uh, but really, uh, the person that I, I want to take a minute, King is still going strong, coming to work every day. But this year, we lost one of the giants of the, the school, Dr. Uh, Bob Day, uh, who was a former dean of the school, uh, died within the last few weeks, continued to support the school uh, strongly, um, actively was, uh, you know, had the opportunity to speak with him many times over the last few months. And uh, his presence as large as it was in the School of Public Health was even larger at the Fred Hodgson Cancer Research Center where he went to be the director. And as you probably, some of you might know, the campus at South Lake Union is the Bob Day campus to, uh, to honor his contributions to the school and a memorial service for him is gonna be this Saturday down at the Bob Day campus in uh, South Lake Union. I'm gonna turn a little bit to highlight some research. Um, uh, our faculty, staff, and students continue to do a great and amazing work, and research has continued to be the uh, uh, a centerpiece of all of the school, and really what are among schools of public health something that we've always been known for and continue to be known for. Uh, each of the departments gave to me sets of highlights that I could use to highlight in the school, and as I look at this list now, there's just no way I can get through all of these, so I'm going to. Uh, um, uh, uh, take an opportunity to, to uh, send something out to people to highlight all these great things that we had because I think we're going to have want more time for question and answer rather than to go through this uh, amazing list of things that we have done that are going on in the school today. I want to move on to uh, other issues, uh, which is this is a slide, kind of slide you guys have seen before, but it re reflects the, um, the university-wide uh, funding streams that support uh, operating funds at the University of Washington. And I think it's important to understand these streams, where they are, and how things have um, changed over the years between 1990 and the present. And to see what really is uh, um, a huge challenge for the university, all units on campus, which is the, uh, 
the change in how much uh, uh, of the funding per enrolled student at the university, what's happened with regard to the state support for higher education in Washington State. And I think that's important to understand. If you look at the sort of overall trend of how much is being spent um, for students, the trend line, with the exception of a little ups and downs, is actually inflation adjusted relatively constant. And the, um, what makes up the difference has been the amount of revenue that ends up coming from in the form of tuition from students over the course of this time. And I think we have to be, whoops, be pretty um, cognizant of this as we bake our plans and think about how higher education is supported, how we need to work with uh, um, policymakers around this issue, but also realize that our students are spending in real dollars a lot more than they were a few years ago and that this is a serious uh, source of concern. We'll talk a little bit more about those kinds of challenges in a minute, but I want to now focus on where the School of Public Health gets its support because it actually looks a fair bit different from the figure that I just gave you, which was sort of the university-wide operating expenses in which you think that the world exists as a what's coming from the state and what's coming from the uh, tuition. And you'll see that in our uh, economy as a school, uh, almost 80% of the economy of the School of Public Health is really the research that we do, the grants and contracts that are coming in, the work that's being done on the research side, funds that are brought in to do research, funds that go out to pay for the research, to pay for the staff, the students, faculty to work on those projects, the subcontracts that there might be. For us, tuition-based education and fee-based education together are less than 10% of the overall uh, uh, sources of support that come to the school. Um, and uh, state money, which comes to us in the form of what we call supplement for ABB aficionados, makes up about 3% of the school's economy. Uh, and then some other pieces, including the funds that go to the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences with support from state workers' compensation money for occupational health and safety service research and education, which is about equal to the total amount we get from indirect cost returns uh, as, a, as a school. <coughs> Now, if we take the research part of that pie out and we look at where the money's come into the school, um, we can see that over uh, the last five years here, with 2018, the fiscal year we're in now, so these numbers are projected, you can see that, but we have pretty good reason to believe these are right. Um, you can see that if you, if you look across the upper four groups here, most of these sources of revenue have stayed relatively constant over time with the exception of our amount of indirect cost returns slightly declining over time. Everything else is relatively stable with the exception of this bottom purple part of your bar charts here, which is uh, the amount of money we are getting uh, from tuition as a school. And this has highlighted, most highlights the fact that the university is raising a lot more of its money from tuition, but this has really been our main source of, of, of extra revenue as a school, and I think it's important to, to recognize this. And, and as funds for research and the indirect cost returns that go with them have gotten more challenging, this has served to be the most important part of our um, funds. Now, research, as I indicated, there's been a bit of a dip in, in recent years, but actually the news is good, and the news is even better than it looks here, which is that in FY17, we saw a noticeable uptick in direct costs of research coming to the school. Uh, but actually, this is a bit of a, we have, the, we have leading indicators in addition to this sort of real-time indicator of how much money we're spending, which is that awards now for three years straight have continued to be up. So we know that this FY17, which looks like it might be a one-year good year, actually is leading to the next two years also looking solid for the school with regard to the kinds of awards we're getting. So we seem to have weathered a bit of a storm here with regard to research funding, even though everything is challenging. Uh, we, our uh, uh, groups have, uh, have been persistent and tenacious and uh, successful in, in, in keeping funds flowing to keep our research successful, impactful, and powerful as it's been. So that part looks pretty good. I think the financial climate on campus um, 
as a whole, we're in a moment of some anxiety right now about the, the overall school, uh, university economy. While our, our school economy is strong, uh, as I interact with other with leadership and others on campus, it's clear that there's a sense of anxiety about what the next few years holds with regard to uh, the financial climate. And I showed this figure, figure before. Um, uh, but the other item that's going on behind the scenes is, is large shifts in the kinds of major students are, are going into, shifts from humanities and social sciences to STEM degrees, professional degrees as undergraduates, and it's causing a lot of, uh, of uh, concern and challenges to faculty across the university and, um, uh, and, and trying to balance these things while not raising tuition um, um, while not uh, making wholesale changes in faculty alignments on campus is going to prove to be a challenge and we can anticipate a lot of kind of stress at the university level, especially from units uh, which are, uh, feel like they're being negatively impacted by the changes in student majors and so forth across campus. So we've been a relative beneficiary of students getting interested, for example, in our undergraduate major, but other units on campus are feeling the pinch quite a bit more than we are. <coughs> okay, I think there's a lot of interest in the leadership transitions that are going on right now. I want to uh, highlight a few things here. Um, uh, one that I can highlight uh, is that we are uh, um, now in the process of choosing the next chair of the Department of Epidemiology, and I can say even more than that, I can say that we had four outstanding candidates come through and interview that I've had a chance to uh, get a ton of feedback on this, and I've had a chance to uh, um, meet with all of them afterwards, review the feedback, get a sense of how they would like to understand the department and move forward, and that I can tell you even more than that, that tomorrow there will be an announcement that will come out that will tell you who it is because we have uh, made, made the, an offer, the offer has been accepted, and I'm, uh, you'll be getting official word about that tomorrow. So that's all I'm going to tell you today. <laughs> Um, some of you noticed last uh, uh, week I sent out an email to faculty in the school about some new positions that we're hoping to feel, fill. If these positions seem like, uh, like not that new, it's because these are positions that historically we had in the School of Public Health, and we are looking to uh, uh, sort of reorganize our school with a, uh, uh, the kind of uh, framework that actually is um, the norm across our peer institutions of uh, uh, schools of public health, and, and even with other schools of our size across the university, to have an uh, associate dean with a portfolio around research and strategic initiatives, and an associate dean uh, with uh, the uh, portfolio around, uh, in our case, public health practice, but uh, uh, to include a community engagement element as well to that position. So those are the positions. As I wrote in my note last week, uh, I would be uh, happy if anybody, and several of you have reached out to me, and I'm going to say I haven't gotten back to anybody yet. I'm going to do that uh, and start having meetings with people who have expressed an interest, and I look forward to trying to wrap this up uh, shortly. Now, there's this question about a new dean for the School of Public Health. You may have heard there's a search in progress. I can confirm there's a search in progress, um, and that's about what I'm allowed to say. Um, what I'm allowed to say is that the search is uh, the official word from the uh, committee is that the uh, search is going well and uh, that there will be in winter quarter a, a narrowing of applicants to what they call the uh, airport interviews where uh, candidates will have a confidential phase of inquiry with the search committee and then there will be a uh, selection uh, in concert with the president and the provost of a smaller number of people probably in the three to five person range who will come to campus for a public round of, of meetings and interviews, after which there'll be selection of a, the next dean who would start in uh, summer or fall. Um, the uh, uh, focus of the school and focus at the, uh, in a, in, of the university on race and equity is a, uh, a serious um, priority. The president has a race and equity initiative. And one of the great and ongoing challenges uh, uh, for not just our 
our school, but really for our nation, uh, is doing a better job around issues of, uh, of uh, race and equity and, uh, and getting more diversity into our uh, institution. We have had a rocky couple of years, and I think folks are familiar with uh, that fact. And uh, we have been working pretty hard to see what we can do to uh, improve our climate as a school. And there was a survey. We had a town meeting specifically on this topic with our consultants, ORS Impact. This is just a summary slide showing that um, uh, even though overall most people felt comfortable with the climate in the school, there was plenty of people who didn't feel that way and plenty of people who had had negative experience or observed negative experience, hostile conduct, uh, and so forth. We're taking a number of steps to try to address this and improve this, um, and uh, we are currently in the process of uh, uh, hiring a director of equity, diversity, and inclusion. I want to thank those of you who, who met with our finalists as they came through, and we, really, we had a tremendous interest in the position, a lot of excitement about these candidates. I think every one of the four will, will potentially do an amazing job for our school, and we set today as the deadline for people to give us feedback. So uh, I know not that many of you have responded yet, so if you could send something today, that would be really great. So this is, consider this your uh, last chance. So we're going to be making, hopefully, start, uh, we'll review all the um, uh, feedback that we get and be in the process of, of, of finalizing this, um, uh, you know, start negotiating with a preferred candidate in the next week or so if we can pull that off. So we're, we're excited about this. All the candidates were extremely excited about working in the school, and there was really a lot of positive energy around the commitment they see the school making to do a better job in this sphere. I want to also highlight an uh, initiative that actually came out of a working group of, of people who wanted to look at how might we Im uh, improve uh, faculty ranks in the school around equity and diversity and around race. And a call came from that group uh, to uh, launch uh, a center, uh, an anti-racism center for health. We're calling it the ARCH initiative. Sometimes the words are different, like the anti-racism and community health center are different things. But we are, uh, we're working on this, and we, are, um, we have now uh, got a draft job description. It's going through the final vetting processes, and we're expecting that in the next two weeks we are going to uh, launch a national search for uh, a scholar to work specifically in the area of race and health and to lead, provide leadership to our school in this space. And part of the idea here is that while we're doing the work internally to try to improve the climate for our staff and students and faculty and to build a more diverse student body and a more diverse faculty ranks, we also can w do the work of uh, building a relationship with the outside community and studying the relationship between race and health uh, in our nation and then that's uh, and in our in our communities in uh, Washington state and so we're excited about this as a step forward other steps we've been taking that came out of the issues over the last year was launching a new scholarship program at the school to specifically recruit candidates that we feel can add to the diversity of our student body and we're uh, just a, this is our first class of students who uh, were, as a recruitment enticement, we received a $20,000 uh, additional scholarship to attend uh, our school. And we're just in the process now of beginning the process for this next year where we're going to make the same commitment again to scholarships to recruit outstanding students. I want to mention again. Um, or new to this audience, I guess, a, uh, a new initiative that I'm personally uh, uh, extremely excited about and have been talking uh, with people across campus about launching. And I'm hoping to really launch this as an uh, initi initiative under the aegis of the uh, Population Health Initiative at the, at the university, but to, to build a, a real institute-level activity in the school that's focused on health equity and understanding health disparities, building uh, um, evidence-based uh, policy evaluation, policy analysis, and guidance in uh, evaluating policies that we can use to try to reduce health disparities and 
build towards the kind of equity that we'd like to see in, in health. Um, the goal is to do this in a, a community-engaged process, to work with community organizations, especially community organizations across uh, Washington State as the state flagship public health university, and to do that work in uh, uh, four domains, uh, at the uh, uh, one level being health systems work, where we're working on trying to improve access to care and quality uh, of care, the most upstream social uh, determinants of health, racism, oppression, economic opportunity, uh, educational opportunity, and then community level indicators, uh, community level predictors, uh, modifiable community level predictors, the built environment, uh, safety, uh, again, education, uh, and then individual, what I'm referring to as modifiable uh, at uh, individual level things, which are often what we focus on the most in the uh, public health sphere, which is improving access to preventive services, uh, public health protections by health departments, and so forth. So I'd be happy to talk more about that as we roll that out. I mentioned the Population Health Initiative. This is now in its second year, Anamar Kausi's ambitious 25-year uh, campaign to have the University of Washington be the really the world leader in impact on population health. Uh, the initiative is really still taking shape, um, but a few of the uh, actions thus far of the initiative have been travel fellowships for uh, students and cross-disciplinary research, uh, pilot grants, uh, of which a few folks in our school were uh, um, uh, successful. Uh, Joe Zunt, Peter Rabinowitz, Jen Otten were successful in receiving awards, and then call for research is, for applications is out again now. Um, and now a, uh, a new initiative to provide bridge funding for the hiring of faculty, and we'll be hearing more about what the uh, provost has chosen in that regard probably in the next few weeks. Uh, shout out and some, many of the people, it's actually a handful of people in the room who are active on the executive council of the Population Health Initiative. But I want to give a special shout out to India who's taken on really a leadership role now. Um, uh, leading the, I'm going to try to get this right here. Let's see. It's a lot of words. Which I lost my mouse. Can't do that. Anyway experiential learning and interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary stuff. stuff. It's uh, one of the more ambitious sides of the work that we're hoping that the Population Health Initiative takes on. The Population Health Initiative is also the rubric under which this new building is taking shape on campus. This is an artist's rendering looking to the southeast from, uh, yes, I think I've got that right. Uh, down 15th here and the drive-in entrance at the west end of campus over here with a building uh, that uh, we will uh, be breaking ground for in April of this year, the population current, this is, this is the working name for the title. I don't think this is the name that the building is actually going to have when it opens, but we're calling it the Population Health Facility. Groundbreaking taking place in April. By fall of 2018, they're expecting that the core and shell will basically be in place. And occupancy by fall of 2020 is the timeline we're working on now. Um, this shows from above where the building would lie, physics and astronomy over here, the uh, architecture hall uh, on the side, and then the drive into campus where the gatehouse is off of 15th um, to the north. And another artist rendering this thing that has kind of two, looks like two buildings here, is actually the uh, current way that the building is, even though it's really one building, but it kind of looks like two here. So that's what we're looking at right now. Um, roughly eight floors, um, lots of uh, faculty, staff, and student space built into this building. Another hallmark of our school is our commitment to service and the community. Our service learning opportunities continue to increase um, through all of our practicum activities, undergraduate internship, nutritional sciences graduate programs, COPHP, obviously, heavy involvement in the community. Um, this quarter, 235 School of Public Health undergraduate public health students are out in the community working at 40 sites. Many of them are helping agencies deal with the homeless crisis 
and it's clear that our students are needed as, to serve communities uh, as much and more than ever. Oh, did I miss a slide there? No. Um, we take part in a lot of great summer programs as well. That are ex uh, uh, This is a picture from the uh, Summer Health Professionals Education Program, um, which broadened recently to include public health as a focus in addition to medicine and dentistry as a training in health professionals, bringing students uh, from uh, underrepresented groups and uh, uh, gr uh, groups in need of greater exposure to the opportunities in the health professions to campus. Uh, Sarah McKenzie is the uh, co-PI of this. We had 80 students on campus this last year, funded through a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson program, spending uh, time during the summer getting exposure to public health and what's, what it means. Give a shout out to Livable City Year. Uh, this is a unique program that allows cities to tap into the expertise and student energy of the UW. Uh, I especially want to shout out because the co-lead of this program is uh, Jen Otten of Nutritional Sciences and DEOHS. Uh, the first year was in highlighted Auburn, the second year is in Tacoma, and they're just beginning the process now of thinking about year, where year three is going to be. In terms of service, we have, uh, uh, for the last several years, have had a formal service experience at the Seattle King County Clinic that holds a, uh, an event at Key Arena. We had 69 students from the school at an event, four-day event, uh, uh, which provided over uh, $3.5 million in health services uh, free of charge to community members in need. So just want to put a spotlight on the concept of the academic health department. It's a, uh, a new... Uh, well, several year now, uh, growing trend to to build relationships between academic institutions and uh, public health agencies, but also to make sure that public health agencies uh, are operating with an evidence-based fashion in what they do. And we just formed a formal uh, memorandum of understanding between the North, uh, Northwest Center uh, for Public Health Practice and Public Health Seattle King County, making it a academic health department. And I guess I'm scooping our public announcement of that, which is going to go out tomorrow as well. It's a day for public announcements. So that's exciting. Uh, it's been an ex uh, extraordinarily good year in terms of uh, fundraising and advancement for the school. Um, the Be Boundless campaign, as some of you know, is a $5 billion university-wide fundraising campaign that we are now well into. Uh, our, university, our, our school's goal was $305 million, and we have exceeded our campaign goal. I'll give you a little more window into what that means. Um, we've had 2,300 donors. Uh, we had a, um, uh, $190 million in private foundation grants, uh, almost $17 million in individual gifts and bequests, and we've set a goal to raise that to $20 million by July of 2020. Uh, that does include half, we get sort of half credit for the $210 million gift to this, for the new building. So $105 million was credited towards our campaign goal. But even if, even if you didn't have that, you can see we've been doing pretty well with regard to this. I want to highlight the faculty staff retiree campaign for students. Uh, which uh, raised nearly $232,000 in new support for the school. 18 donors gave to 17 funds with gifts of $10,000 or more, benefiting 15 endowments. We were one of the top units across campus in having faculty, staff, and retirees step up in that way for our students. And for the size of our school, really uh, out punched our weight, I guess I would say, in that regard. We do have several new endowments to be proud of in 2017. Um, we have the, uh, the new Bezrushka Family Endowed Professorship for the Public Understanding of Population Health, which is a new school-wide professorship, which we're uh, going to be looking to get somebody into this year and take advantage of this amazing uh, and very uh, generous gift uh, from uh, uh, faculty of our school. Uh, uh, the Norm Breslow Endowed Faculty Fellowship in Biostatistics, the uh, uh, DDD Triple D Endowed Visiting Lectureship in Global Health of Women, Adolescents, and Children, the Bill Dowling Endowed Faculty Fellowship 
in Health Administration, the Bruce Fowler Endowed Fund. And that's all I'm able to see here on my list. So I'm going to stop with there. I just want to highlight an event we had this year as well. Um, we, we had a screening to uh, benefit the public health genetics program of the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. And this was a, actually probably the best attended school event that we've had in maybe the history of the school. We had over 700 people here to come out for a school-wide uh, screening of the movie, followed by a, a panel discussion led by our former dean, Gil Oman. Um, and, uh, uh, Gail Jarvik, Tim Thornton, and I think Jay Schinder on the other side there. I can't see in this light. Communications is another part of what the school uh, has been building out. And, and our goal in communication is really to, uh, to do a few things. It's to uh, explain our mission to the outside and create a sense of community for our folks within the school. Demonstrate our passion for research. We've been uh, taking advantage of some, uh, led by uh, Jeff Hodson and his group, taking advantage of a survey we conducted on what, what people wanted to see, knowing that uh, our team, that our, our faculty, staff, and students wanted more news about research. So we've been adding more information on that, wanted more information on internal initiatives and school policy, and wanted more information on events of school-wide interest. Um, we send this out electronically to all 3,000 students, staff, and faculty. It's also now more mobile friendly and doing all the right things. Our school's actually been notably successful uh, in getting uh, itself seen across campus. UW Today, uh, in one year, had 140 SPH mentions, which is most days of the year, that means. We had something out there for people to see. Lots of features in Columns Magazine. I don't know if people saw the most recent issue that featured uh, the opioid epidemic, called out uh, our faculty, uh, Caleb Banta Green and um, Gary Franklin, for their, their work, um, notably. Um, and we are uh, actually doing extremely well with, our, uh, with the work that we're doing. We're now the, among our sort of public peer institutions, we have. Uh, by the kinds of metrics you can get now, uh, we have reached a, we have a potential what they call a potential media reach of more than 1.5 billion, with more than 2,200 news articles, which is uh, well above our uh, our public peers. Um, and again, with a, we have a I would say a limited budget we spend on communications, we're doing a pretty good job in that framework. Okay, that segues into one question that I do want to ask people if they can think about as we enter into a question and answer period, which is how do we build a stronger sense of community for the School of Public Health? Uh, our communications is one part of that. Are there events we should be doing? Are there other activities we should be having other than an event, a school-wide meeting like this? Um, I recall in the not so distant past, for example, we had a uh, distinguished faculty lecture series that we had and that was uh, disbanded a few years ago because it was felt to be um, uh, no longer meeting the need that we had as a school. Should we do that? Should we do something else? I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. I have some ideas, but I'd be interested in hearing what people have to say. And at that, that is the comments I wanted to make. I know I've gone over time, but it's uh, um, time for questions and answers. And uh, to hear what <laughs> and afterwards, we'll be meeting in the third floor, F wing, for a reception, and in the, uh, the, the common offices of the school. And uh, we'll be there. Yeah. So, questions, comments, things you want to hear about the school? We even have a microphone to pass around. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> people met one year rich in a new face at the school of public health. We didn't raise your head when we said new staff at the school. Juanita <laughs> <laughs> Ricks is the program operations specialist in the office of the Dean for Student and Academic Services. And we're really excited to have her on board. 
and she's holding a microphone waiting to take your questions. <laughs> I know there are questions, but I, I uh, was just in another thing just before this, the founder's reception. I have a question. Do you have any sense of how many students are unable to come? You went into the figures and the fact that tuition. Um, hi, I'm Jim Gale. I'm a former faculty in epidemiology, and um, I was just wondering how many students do you think can't come or get turned away because they can't afford it? And uh, I know we do the best we can to support them, but is there any measure of how many students who otherwise would come? That's a super good question. I don't know if we have a... Uh, handle on exactly that dimension. Who are the people who would like to come but don't because of financial obstacles? Uh, or maybe who are wooed well, away by other schools because they get a well, better offer. I mean, we know that we have abundant anecdotal information at the PhD level that students uh, often make their decision about where to go based on who gives them the best financial package and that we are less good at making firm commitments to as many students as we would like to take here, would like to be. Um, at the undergraduate and master's level, we do have we do have data, although I don't have, a, have it on the tip of my tongue, about uh, not so much who's not coming, but we have data on how much debt people are leaving with. Collecting that kind of data, and are very sensitive to that data as we look at things like what the tuition should be and the degree to which we, we have no control over what's called resident undergraduate tuition levels. So that's one tuition across the entire university. That's, that's the driver of that increase that you see there on the, how much tuition has gone up. But we've you know, kept our tuition more or less in check for most of our programs, uh, although that doesn't apply so much to even the fee-based programs or the, uh, the Masters in Public Health, which has crept up over the years as it needs to do as a professional degree. It's complicated issue, and I don't have I don't have the number. Anybody have those numbers? I'm sure Amy has a follow-up question. Well, it's a yeah, follow-up comment, I guess. So I noticed in your data that uh, our revenues are four percent from fee-based and five percent from tuition, which sort of indicates that our fee-based students are roughly half, maybe, although I guess they pay more than tuition, so it's hard to equate percent of revenues with percent of students. Yes, and part of that is because of the peculiarities of the bookkeeping accounting system and the way that operating expenses are treated differently in the two So I, yeah. I can't speak to that nuance. But as, you know, our fee-based students, just to be clear, are paying the full cost of their education with no contribution at all from the state of Washington. And the budgets of fee-based programs include overhead to the university, overhead to the school, overhead to the department, and overhead to PCE, which is the entity that organizes fee-based programs. So, you know, a good 40% of our budgets are just overhead and then less than half go to faculty. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the idea that well, things have changed at the University of Washington and our school is often do this work with like other units on campus is that we are balancing much more of the, of the budget on the backs of our students than we ever did before. I think that's a... I would summarize your comment that way, and I think that it's true, and that's what the figure shows, and that reaches across all parts of the university, unfortunately. It's not a very up comment. Anybody got something else? I can say? Yes. Joel, here's one. Um, Doug Conrad, Professor Emeritus in the Department of Health Services. One of the exciting developments you mentioned was the health administration program now being administratively housed in the School of Public Health. 
and um, still maintaining our academic appointments and research connections with the Department of Health Services. The question I have is, what do you see as the role in the larger scope of public health in our school for the health management education and some of that kind of research? I know you've had some good conversations with uh, faculty in the program and in our department. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I, I, mean, I think that the, that's a super important question, and I think the issue is how do we both highlight the strength of the School of Health Administration, but also build that program as with more research emphasis than it's had in a while, I think, and that, you know, one of the, have been one of the, you know, sort of research stalwarts in that, associated with that activity in the, in the school, um, and we need to figure out how to make that a sustainable and successful faculty track in administrative relevant health uh, research. How do we how do we do that? How do we build that? And I think that's a you know that's a kind of a strategic question. And I know in the Department of Health Services this year, you've actually got a, a couple of recruitments that are going to launch for faculty in. Um, uh, who are health, econ health economics and um, potentially other areas that could be, I think, form that bridge of scholar, scientist, and health administration instructor that I think we, you know, is a part of the balance that maybe we've lost a little bit. So that's what we need to, I think we need to work on that. Does that make sense? Yeah. One, one brief comment. The, perhaps the last year of the state innovation model evaluation, which I'm principal investigator on, which involves a number of our faculty in the department, but also some collaboration with the Department of Health, the Healthcare Authority, and DSHS down Olympia, could be a springboard as we follow on uh, in terms of involving uh, a broad mix of people, not just health management, but others. That's one concrete research-oriented idea we can build on, I think. Dave Grombowski is going to build helpful and important key in that, that will work. Stephen Bezrushka. Hi, I'm uh, Stephen Bezrushka. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be, I, I realize, in the number three school, public health in the world. That's, that's phenomenal <coughs> news. You mentioned a sense of anxiety about the financial situation at the University of Washington. And I want to suggest that we create another sense of anxiety. As, as somebody who grew up uh, in the 60s, the responsibility of academics, uh, of intellectuals, was to society. And we seem to have lost that a little bit because for the last three years now, our health, is at, as, as measured by life expectancy, is actually declining. Nobody is talking about this. I wonder if it wouldn't be our, to build a stronger sense of community in the School of Public Health that we actually be one of the few institutions in the country to try and address not just improving health, but stemming the decline in our health. I hate to ask this question, I but it's I what I do, it's, you know, <laughs> it's my life. I mean, I think, you're, I think you're exactly right. I mean, I think we need to be, um, leading and be out there in the areas of trying to get at what's what we're doing wrong in society about health right now. Uh, and there's lots of things we're doing wrong and um, and may probably stem as much from issues like uh, income inequality and other things that are rising, uh, but also epidemics that we know about, like uh, you know, substance abuse epidemics and uh, crisis in thinking about mental health and many other mega trends that are going on in our society right now. Uh, but we need to be at the forefront of, of working on those things and doing scholarship on them and doing public advocacy on those issues as well. I, I, don't, I don't think I heard a question, but a comment, well, and I agree with your comment. Our job be to create some anxiety about our declining health status. Nobody is talking about that. You know, I think it's the responsibility of a school of public health and the Population Health Initiative to try and uh, um, tell it like it is. And, and you know, if we're anxious about our financial situation, we should be anxious about our health situation. Well said. Thanks. Well, 
more comments, questions? I know there's lots of people who never Could you say more about the academic health department? I find that intriguing, and you say there's going to be more tomorrow said about that, but you've named a number of new initiatives, which are all very exciting, but I would love to hear more about that one. So I'll highlight Betty Beckemeyer's event. Is there still a microphone that we can pass to her here? Uh, Betty Beckmeyer, if you haven't met Betty, is, the, is a professor and the director of the Northwest Center for Public Health Practice and has been the uh, spark plug behind working with our public health agency partners in the area of building this concept of academic health. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the academic health departments, it's, it's not, you know, maybe I've been... Uh, not necessarily the spark plug. One of a few spark plugs. Don't you need many spark plugs? <laughs> but um, but, it, <laughs> but um, the academic, the whole notion of this academic health department. We did actually have one, you know, formally with Public Health Seattle King County some years back with some some um, funding. I think it was from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So it's not a a brand new, you know, earth shattering concept necessarily. Um, but the bottom line is we're taking, growing and developing and formalizing what's happened in the past and trying to, to um, work together to really make the most out of what we can do together. And in particular, working, uh, creating this directly with Public Health Seattle King County. And, um, and uh, in this case, we've just signed a MOU, it's, it, um, a very involved MOU with Public Health Seattle King County, with the School of Public Health, and also with the School of Nursing um, to, create, to formalize a lot of the work we've been doing already, but also giving it kind of a platform through which we can also try to leverage um, more funding and maybe staff time. We articulate the need for kind of staff to help coordinate and better streamline how we work together. Um, in terms of sharing faculty, sharing staff, or promoting what we can do and how and with students. Um, so you'll be hearing more of that. In fact, there's, there's some of that opportunity is, is, um, is moving along. I can't, we'll see. Um, and then also with the um, Washington DOH. Uh, that's really moved um, uh, a great deal uh, ahead as well with uh, Secretary Wiesman has been very, very invested in having an academic health department with us at DOH and, and together we've been um, working on a big and very involved strategic plan about how to advance practice-based research, opportunities for students, leveraging uh, one another, assuring that what we're doing is, is um, useful to, to practice and vice versa. So that's, that's it in a nutshell and there's a lot of movement around that, uh, around developing these relationships and, and formalizing them around the structure. So anybody that's got more interest in that, let me know. And thanks, Joel, for all your encouragement around that. Okay, so it is uh, 4.30. I've mostly done the talk. Question before we head up for environment where academia is under fire as the enemy of truthiness, um, what do you see as the role of this school, not just in dealing with a political context, but it, you also touched on the student preference, at least at the undergraduate level, for STEM education and a movement away from the broad broader liberal arts education. What do you see as the role of this school in addressing those kinds of challenges? Well, I mean, those represent, so I mean, in the issues that relate directly to public health policy and, uh, and advocacy, I think our school and our faculty should continue to be loud and strong voices in that area. On the issues that sort of are the higher education trends, like the moves from liberal arts education to STEM education, I think we actually have an interesting, exciting role to play in being able to pitch the education that we offer 
as something that actually is both a liberal arts education because our public health major and our other undergraduate programs, environmental, occupational sciences, can really form the basis of a liberal arts education at the same time as we're meeting people's need for something that seems a little more science and education focused and that lets people tell their parents that that's what they're majoring in, for example. It sounds like science and occupation in a vocationally oriented field, but it's really also liberal arts and public health, and we're not missing the humanity side of those topics. Um, and, uh, um, and making, by, I mean, we, we don't, I mean, we're, we're not so concerned about the people who graduate from our public health major getting a degree, getting a job in a public health agency. We want them to be informed citizens who understand public health and are a public health educated citizenry. Um, and that's an exciting place for us as a school to be turning out students who are going to be uh, not only good citizens, but people who have a fun scientific foundation in public health. It's a great balance. I don't know if that answered your question, but lots of opportunities. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And move up to the third floor for refreshments and say hello to people and take it from there.